Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome to the Pet Lover Summit. My name is Aina Spirit Walker, and I have the amazing Ellie Lax here with me today. Ellie Lax is the founder of The Gentle Barn and the author of My Gentle Barn. She has a national organization, which is The Gentle Barn, a national organization that rescues and rehabilitates unwanted animals and heals people with the same stories of abuse and neglect. Ellie has rescued thousands of animals and hosted hundreds of thousands of children and adults who come to The Gentle Barn looking for hope. Ellie is a powerful speaker, celebrated animal welfare advocate, humane educator, and the author of My Gentle Barn, creating a sanctuary where animals heal and children learn to hope. Ellie founded The Gentle Barn in 1999, and she invented her own gentle healing method, which allows old, sick, injured, and terrified animals, animals to fully recover using a mixture of Western medicine, holistic healing modalities, holding therapy, and lots of love. Ellie is an expert in healing orphaned and sick animals like puppies with parvo and calves from veal crates. Ellie is also a professional animal communicator, public speaker, and the creator of cow hug therapy. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you so much for being part of the Pet Lovers Summit. We're so excited to have you here today. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm honored. I have so been looking forward to this subject matter, the emotional well-being of animals, how emotional healing helps physical healing. This is such a huge part of healing that so many miss. And I'm really looking forward to what you have to share with us today about your experience and the stories that you might have to share with us as well. Yeah, so the Gentle Barn is 23 years old and we have hundreds and hundreds of animals. And the Gentle Barn's niche is to take in animals that have nowhere else to go, animals that are already too old, too sick, too lame, or too scared to be adoptable by anybody else. Wow. So they're coming in sicker than the average animal. And um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we start with veterinary care and yeah. the veterinary, you know, we have incredible veterinarians that give medication and stitches and surgeries and help our animals thrive and live. But there are so many times where Western medicine kind of hits a wall where they yep. do everything they can. They've kind of done everything that they can. And they're kind of saying like, look, you know, we've done all we can. There's nothing more that we can think of. It's time to put this animal down, but you can look in this animal's eyes and you can know that they are not done here yet. And they want to yes. live. And so what do you do then? And so through the years of the gentle barn, we have had to think outside the box and we have had to come up with other modes of healing when veterinary medicine, you know, falls short. And so yeah. over the years, I've kind of like kept adding to my healing toolbox, if you will. And so mm -hmm. not only do we use veterinary medicine to heal our animals, but we also use acupuncture, acupressure, chiropractics, deep tissue massage therapy, ultrasound, ice therapy, water therapy, nutritional supplements, Jill and Jones CBD, Sun Chlorella algae superfood, pure remedy salve for the skin. And of course, lots and lots and lots of love, as well as music therapy and reading to them. Um, yes. So we've kind of collected this really big toolbox in being able to heal animals when veterinary medicine can't, yeah. but there was a pivotal moment. Um, so my husband was, so my husband, uh, Jay Weiner and co-founder of the gentle barn, he actually has forged incredible relationships with stockyards, auction houses, slaughterhouses, oh. um, and abusers themselves. He can go oh. in and kind of befriend them and be able to yeah. rescue their animals and tra transform their places. Um, and we, he was called by the auction house saying, we've got some down cows, will you come and get them? Um, so he was driving there and he called me up and he said, okay, I've got six veal calves. They're eight weeks old. They're pretty much more dead than alive. I'm putting them in the trailer. I'm going to drive them home. And I had about two hours, you know, the time of his drive to figure out how in the world I'm going to keep them alive. Now, I had remembered years prior to this, visiting another sanctuary and seeing a little teeny tiny orphaned veal calf by herself in a barn, getting medical attention, 
but I kind of peered in on her and she was just sitting there by herself. She looked so sad and so sick and it oh. kind of hurt my heart that she was alone in there. So yeah. that image stayed with me. Fast forward to this moment where I have two hours to figure out how to keep these veil calves alive. I started calling around to some of the biggest sanctuaries in the world saying, I've never rescued veal calves before. This was our first veal calf rescue uh -huh. this was 15 years ago. And I said, I've never rescued a veal calf, but they're coming to the gentle barn. I want to know what should I buy? What should I have? What should I know in yeah. order to save their lives? And every single solitary one of those sanctuaries said to me, the only thing I need to know is that they're going to die. Can you, for and one second, can you explain why veal calves, like what is the process of a veal calf just briefly so people understand why they're so sick? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking. Okay, yeah. so basically the only way to get milk from a cow is to get the cow pregnant. So mm -hmm. we're raised in our society and they start teaching us in kindergarten, what comes from a cow? Milk. And some schools even have a dairy cows come to the schools and the kids can take turns milking her. So we're kind yeah. of conditioned to think that cows are this special milk animal that has milk coming out of them. But the truth is yeah. that cows only have milk for their babies, just like I had breast milk for my babies. And now my kids are older and I don't have milk. Dogs have yeah. milk for their puppies. Cats have milk for their kittens and so on. Mm -hmm. Every mammal has milk for their babies. So cows are no different. They right. get pregnant, the baby's born, they have milk for their babies to drink. When the babies are older and they stop nursing, the milk dries up. So yeah. what the dairy industry has to do to get milk from a cow for people to drink is they have to impregnate thousands of cows, take their babies away and kill them and steal the milk for people. And so yeah. there's this epidemic in America of these eight week old baby veal calves that are either stomped, chained or imprisoned in little boxes so that they can't move. So their muscle doesn't develop. So they remain very, very mushy and soft. And they're sold as this delicacy in French and Italian restaurants as veal. Right. And, and that is why their, veal is so tender. Yes. It's tender because it's babies that were never allowed to run or play or even walk, walk around. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. Thank you for unpacking that. I think that's an important part of the story. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah. And so, so the okay, reason so why they're like, so they're sick. They're just going to die. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The reason they're so sick is because they're taken away from their moms at a day old, put into a box and... I would say 80% of them just die because yeah. why would they live? But the, the small percentage that actually make it to eight weeks, they're sent to slaughter. And most of them are so sick by that point that they can't stand. And a law was passed several years ago that if a, an animal can't stand, then they can't be processed for a profit. Okay. So now all these auction houses are calling us saying, well, this animal can't stand. So come and get them off our hands, which we're okay. very happy to do. Right. Okay. Oh, so, so I called the rescues. They're telling me that the only thing I need to know is that they're going to die. And what I flash back on is that image of that little teeny tiny baby yeah. alone in a barn. And I'm like, well, if they're just sticking them alone in a barn and giving them medical attention, of course, they're all going to die. They don't have yeah. a mom. They don't have friends. They don't have love. They don't have the ray of the sun and the healing of the earth. They literally have nothing to live for. So of course they're going to die. So in the two yeah. hour span that um, Jay was driving to the gentle barn, I said to myself, I'm going to do something different than anyone else. Yes. I'm going to focus on their medical healing, but I'm also going to focus on their emotional healing. So what do they need? They need love. They need to know that they're safe and protected. They need to know that they belong to someone, that there's someone there that cares. So I started picking up the phone and calling around to every single person I could get a hold of asking if they would commit to four hour shifts all, um, a four hour shifts and each person was signed up all through the day and all through the night. So for the first seven months that they were with us, they were not alone for five seconds. Wow. I also had energy healers come in. I had violinists and pianists and guitarists come in. I had singers come in. I sat with them through the night and sang to them and read to them. And we literally had volunteers. They would bring their cots and their sleeping bags and they would read and hold them and kiss them and love them. And we would all collectively sit there and we would paint the picture of the life that, that was awaiting them. 
that one day they're going to feel better and they're going to have clean water and fresh food and they're going to jump up for joy and kick up their heels and they're going to have the company of other animals and they're going to have the gentle strokes of human hands and they're going to have these beautiful glorious lives at the gentle barn where they're going to be family forever mm -hmm. and as we told that story and painted that picture yeah they got more and more hope and determination that aided in Yay! the physical healing process and uh. yes it seven months, but they made it. That's awesome. I knew I was going to cry during this interview, by the way. I'm, trying. I'm so excited about the work that you're doing. That is phenomenal. So you have literally broken the mold because everybody else who's ever encountered a veal calf has said, that's it. They're dying. Yeah. And you had all these babies that made it. And I will tell you that since that day, um, yeah. And we have rescued hundreds of veal calves since. Wow. And in the 15 years that we've been doing this, I think we've lost two and they came in already like just unsavable. Uh, other than that, they've all made it. Wow, that is amazing. That's absolutely amazing and totally a testament to the emotional yeah. component that's required for all of us. And I think, you know, for people who aren't um, familiar with with energy work or even emotional components of of animals, if we think about step back and think about ourselves, like, you know, if anybody's ever stuck in the hospital and they're just getting poked and prodded and they're all by themselves and they, you know, no friends are allowed to come, it's depressing, it's awful. And as soon as you get home and you see your friends and you're eating the food that you love and you're in the surroundings where people are visiting you and hugging you, you feel so much better. Yeah. And that's what you've created for all of these animals. Yeah. And then um, the next thing to happen on my journey was um, we kept coming across parvo puppies. You know, the shelters know about us and they'll call us when there's animals that are not adoptable. And among mm -hmm. them are parvo puppies that are so okay. sick. The rescues don't want them because it's so contagious. It's so costly. And, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, if you ask any other rescue, um, what the survival rate is for a puppy with parvo, they're going to say the same answer as veal calves, that they just don't make it, they don't live. Yeah. And what is parvo? Um, so thank you again. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, you're really good. Um, so parvo is a very contagious virus mm -hmm. that depletes the immune system and dehydrates the body, causes vomiting and diarrhea, really, really high fevers. And, uh, can most of the time be fatal in right. tiny puppies. Now it can technically be contracted by adult dogs, but mm -hmm. they usually weather through it. It really mm -hmm. just takes the toll on newborn babies. So when you yeah. think like high kill shelters where dogs are coming in and going out and dogs are giving birth there, yeah. um, the, the spread of disease and the virus and is rampant. And, and okay. the abandonment and the heartbreak that these dogs have gone through to get For there, sure. those viruses are rampant. So the shelters will call us and say, you know, mm -hmm. we've got this litter of puppies with parvo, will you take them? Okay. And so I kind of thought to myself, well, it's the same kind of thing as these calves. If yeah. you take a puppy who has been separated from his mom, has an extremely high fever, diarrhea, vomiting, dehydrated, mm -hmm. um, and you isolate that puppy in the back of a vet's office in a cage with fluids yes. in there, that puppy once again has nothing to live for and they have a really, really extremely high death rate. Mm -hmm. So what can I do to help these puppies live? And so instead of giving them to the vets, I came up with a three-part process. One is to boost their immune system with some chlorella algae superfood. Okay. And of course they're not eating, but you can syringe little amounts uh, down their throat, you know, like every 30 to 60 minutes. Yeah. The second component is to give them sub-Q fluids to keep them hydrated. Yeah. And the third and most important component is to hold them and not let them isolate. And so oh. when we bring in parvo puppies, I enlist my kids, their friends, all our volunteers, our volunteers' friends, and they come over and they literally spend 24 hours a day holding these puppies while they sleep, while they play, while they watch TV, they just hold them. Mm -hmm. And since mm -hmm. I've implemented this process, once again, like the calves with veal, from Veal, we have not less, lost any parvo puppies and we've rescued hundreds of them. That and is amazing. Yeah. That is amazing. Um, we even did um, um, a rescue from a hoarding situation where they had 250 dogs. <gasps> and oh. yeah, it was crazy. No. 
and 45 of which were puppies with parvo. Oh God. And they were all very, very sick. And we brought them all to the vet and the vet said, I want to euthanize all of them. And I said, oh. absolutely not. And brought 45 puppies home to my house. Oh, my <laughs> I'm ready to move in. I'm ready. <laughs> and we held them and loved them. And uh, 48 hours later, they were symptom free and we found homes for all of them. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. The proof is there. You have the statistics and you have the track record to make such a big difference. And I have to say, there are a lot of holistic veterinarians um, on this panel and are watching this. And I really hope they implement the information that you're giving because it is key. Um, I want to just salute all of the holistic veterinarians and saying thank you for what you're doing for these animals. Um, mm. Don't get me wrong. Western medicine is very, very, very important and it saves oh, yeah. the lives of many of our animals. Mm -hmm. But to kind of broaden your reach and broaden your knowledge and embrace other things like acupuncture and nutritional supplements, I just think those that are brave enough and open enough to broaden their reach and yes. scope to really mm -hmm. commit to killing these animals, they're going to have more successes and they're going to save the lives of their animals and, yes. and their people. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. Um, oh my gosh. I have so many stories, but I'm also tongue tied all at the same time. Do you, um, oh, tell us about cow hug therapy. Cause that's, that has an emotional component to it as well. And that's something that you guys offer at the dental bar. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. So, um, 23 years ago when I rescued my very first cow, her name is, was Buddha mm -hmm. and Buddha was extraordinary. She was a smallish fluffy red cow with a white face and big brown teddy bear ears, a puppy mm -hmm. dog nose and beautiful, long, long, long magical eyelashes. Yes. And, um, I could tell the minute I met her that she was very special. Um, but I was starting a nonprofit organization. I was trying to save animals that I've never done before. I was also going through a divorce. So there was lots of going oh. things going on in my life. And yeah. so at the end of long days, she would be laying down. I would sit next to her and lean my body against her just to have someone to cuddle with. Yeah. And she would wrap her neck around me and hold me. Oh, and sometimes I would sob into her shoulders. Other times she would just wash the stress away from the day. Other times mm -hmm. I would talk to her out loud about a problem or challenge I was having and she would help me figure it out. And Love it. in those moments, 23 years ago, I said, everyone needs this. Yes. This is a form of healing that doesn't require thinking or words. It's mm -hmm. something that you feel and it's something that you walk away from transformed. Yes. And so we started rolling it out to every single person that came to the gentle barn, whether they were visiting on a Sunday, coming for a private tour, or they were coming through a foster agency or a probation mm -hmm. camp, drug and alcohol rehab center, domestic violence shelter, homeless shelter, whoever was coming, the first thing we would do is go and hug the cows, not only because they were so transformational, but also because we were dealing with a lot of teenagers that were very defensive and hardened and tough. And yes, I mean, their life made them that way. That was their survival yeah. skill is to be tough and mm -hmm. cold and hard. Yeah. But that's not where healing lives. Healing right. doesn't come from strength. Healing comes from vulnerability and openness. There does. And so I would take those teenagers over to the cows to Buddha and get them to put their faces on her and close their eyes and just breathe in and out and feel her energy. And you could literally see their tough, defensive faces melt into open, yes. humble, vulnerable kids. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. And she cracked them wide open and then their healing could start. Yes. Yes. And so we've been doing that for 23 years, but then when the pandemic hit, I mm. realized that it's not just people in agencies that are in crisis globally, we are all in crisis for sure. And even still, I don't think any of us have even scratched the surface of trying to process what just happened to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we started, um, offering hour long individual cow hug therapy sessions 
for anyone, whether it's someone suffering from depression or anxiety, suicidal ideations, drug addiction, yes. isolation, mm -hmm. loneliness, stress, mm -hmm. or anyone that just needs a good hug, they can come to the general barn and find healing in the barnyard. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. And I have to say, I just found out recently how fluffy and fuzzy and adorable calves are. And I am in love with them. <laughs> They are so magical, awesome. incredible, they extraordinary are. beings, and they, they have really so much are. to offer us. Yes, yes, they all do. And I, I really hope not only from your interview, but from this whole summit that people really recognize, and I'm sure most do because we're all pet lovers, that's why they're here, that animals are sentient beings. And we are here for a symbiotic relationship, in my opinion. Um, you know, we're here to help each other. And once we open our hearts and our minds, and allow things like the work that you're doing, it can transform the world. It really, really can. I agree. Whee! I agree. And like preying on others, using others as a stepping stone, eating, enslaving, wearing, using others. That's yeah. a very kind of patriarchal, dominating, totally. conquer the world kind of ideology. And mm -hmm. I mean, look what we've done to this planet because of it. Yes. And it really is time for every single one of us to awaken to the love that's inside of us, to that feminine energy of lifting yeah. each other up, to recognizing that we're all the same, not different, and yes. to really loving one another. And that's when we'll embrace not only ourselves, not only each other, but the entire planet will just thrive. That is phenomenal. That is absolutely phenomenal. And I just want to reframe and also just confirm what I'm hearing. So you're talking about also not eating meat not eating leather, you know, thinking on a more global scale, thinking on um, how I recently was reading a book, How to Think Like a Buddha. Um, Jay Shetty, I think is the, uh, the author. And there was one adage in there that really struck me. And it said, think about your values and take inventory in your life. Does this check all the boxes of your values? So if you say that you love animals, but you're eating a hamburger and drinking milk with your cereal, you know, cow's milk or whatever. Um, yeah, something's not balanced. And I love that you brought that to the table. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And I know people get a bad rap for being vegetarians and vegans and, and um, being preachy. And um, I really love that. I appreciate that you brought that message out with love. Mm. Thank you. Well, and listen, I mean, I'll break it down into kind of just one little concept. If you, if you took a, if you did a, a study and you asked everyone in the world, if they want, mm -hmm. peace, you're not going to run across someone that says no, they're all going to say yes. Right. Totally. How are we going to bring about peace when we're eating violence and suffering for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Right. Right. It's impossible. We have to be the peace to create the peace. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Let's think about that, people. Let's get that on our tables and in our hearts and minds. It's so important. So, Ellie, tell us what is your website and how can people find you? So, um, our website is gentlebarn.org. And yes. we also, the Gentle Barn is on all social media platforms, including YouTube. People can see mm -hmm. the animals and see their personalities and their stories. Um, and my book, My Gentle Barn, Creating a Sanctuary Where Animals Heal and Children Learn to Hope is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere books are sold. Oh, yes. Please check that out. And um, we want to talk about how people can stay connected with you as well. So how can they stay tuned in to all the amazing things that the Gentle Barn is doing? Yeah, again, on social media, through the website, um, if they live near or in Los Angeles, St. Louis or Nashville. They can come for a visit and hug a cow for themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, click the link for the newsletter. And click the link for the newsletter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So below everybody, we have, um, there's going to be the link for the Gentle Barn. Please check that out. And please click the link below for the newsletter for the Gentle Barn and stay tuned in to all the amazing work that they are doing. Ellie, are there any last words, anything else you want to leave us with? Oh, um, I am just really encouraged that all <laughs> these wonderful people are on your summit and that you're spreading this love and this light, mm. knowledge that we can yes. all 
we can yes. all learn from. Yes. Oh, I appreciate you so much. Thank you for, for those words and for sharing your heart and your work with everybody on this summit. And I, it's really my wish that this makes such a huge impact for all the animals and all the people. I mean, we have to work together. This is why we're here. I appreciate and honor you, Ellie. Thank you so much for being part of the Pet Lovers Summit. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Thank you.